A narrative I've seen infrequently is that a role-playing game requires dice as its randomizer. Typically, this is shorthand for requiring some form of the traditional polyhedral, disallowing custom types of dice like you'd see in Fudge. Personally, I've disagreed with this idea as I don't care for traditions for their own sake, especially since some of those traditions effectively cut off other possible avenues of play. Enter Dragonlance Fifth Age, an adaptation of the long-running fantasy series that uses the saga system of cards as its randomizer instead of traditional dice. Mind you, this was not the only game to use the system, as the Marvel Adventure game did so as well. But I didn't want to double dip into superhero material for this series. While an unorthodox system like this is not necessarily new nowadays, that wasn't exactly the case in the early 90s. Was it merely a flash in the pan, or was the Saga system ahead of its time? Let's find out. My first introduction to the Saga system in this regard was through the box set, which I still have up on my shelf. So we'll be using the books in that as our base. Talking about the layout is tricky, in part due to its age, but there's a few things I can point out. It doesn't come off as clear in the scan, but the ink is a little bit light. Not enough to affect readability, but enough to feel off. The bigger problem I have, though, is the page size. Compared to the box set in AD&D, this box set is small like a micro board game. This makes for smaller books and thus a harder time bookmarking. Not as much of an issue if you're using a scan, but it is a notable thing. Fifth Age utilizes its card-based system from the outset of character creation, using a large deck of cards known as the Fate Deck. We'll be drawing 12 cards from this deck for our character. The first step is Personality, which is divided into two parts. First being Demeanor, which determines how the characters perceive him, and the second is True Nature, which is how the character feels in their heart of hearts. We'll use the two of arrows we drew, making our demeanor meticulous and True Nature resourceful, respectively. The second step is Quests. This acts as the de facto level for characters in Fifth Age, and also determines how many cards that character may have in their hand. We'll use the Seven of Dragons for this, meaning we have seven quests under our belt for a hand size of five. Third is Wealth which determines the kind of resources they can bring to bear as well as reflect their social status. We'll use the Five of Moons for this, making our wealth that, that of a guildsman. Fourth is Ability Scores, where the remaining cards are used, as each Ability Score is associated with a suit. While this is used to determine the Ability Score itself, it's also used to determine the Ability Code. These can be thought of as the skill with using that Ability Score, the letters of which are A if the card uses the same suit as the Ability, B if they're in the same pairing, C if they're in the same category, D if it's from an unrelated category, and X if it's using the dragon suit. Both determine what races the hero qualifies for, as well as the repertoire of abilities available. Taking that into account, we have the following ability scores and codes. Agility 9A, Dexterity 8C, Endurance 9C, Strength 8A, Reason 4A, Perception 8X, Spirit 6A, and Presence 8B. Because of the ability codes, we have the following effects. We can use any shield, we can use light to medium missile weapons and armor, any melee weapon, three schools of sorcery, two diminished senses, in this case smell and touch, three mystic spheres, and we have good leadership. Of the races we qualify for, we'll go with human, increasing our reason by one and decreasing our endurance by one. Since we qualify for three in Sorcery and Mysticism, we'll go with Cryomancy, Electromancy, and Pyromancy for Sorcery, and Channeling, Healing, and Meditation for Mysticism. We also have 16 spell points for Sorcery spells and 36 points for Mysticism spells, since we have a Reason of 4 and a Spirit of 6. Fifth is Roll, the closest thing to Class to Fifth Age. Unfortunately, there are no rolls listed in the main book, so this is a step we'll have to skip. Lastly, Starting Equipment. This is largely dependent on the ability scores mentioned above, and ability codes. So we'll be going with a longsword, a poleaxe, a tower shield, a crossbow, and chainmail. I like the randomized creation, since it adds a degree of strategy in card picks as the hand gets smaller. However, I think there should have been some option in the book for semi-structured creation when players have a specific kind of character in mind, or the GM has a certain kind of power tier in mind. Also, it's clear from the ability scores that certain habits came in from TSR's big game, but we'll get into that later. 
As mentioned before, the Saga system uses a deck of cards known as the Fate deck. This is a deck of 9 suits with values ranging from 1 to 9. 8 of the suits correspond to an ability score. The ninth suit is the Dragon suit, which has its own quirks. When making an action, you play one of the cards from your hand, add its value to the relevant ability score, and compare that to the target difficulty. However, if the card you're playing has a suit that matches the action taken, it's considered trump and you may draw the top card from the fate deck and play that card, adding its value akin to an exploding die in other games. For example, if you played a 3 of shields on a melee attack, you'd merely add 3 to your strength. If you played a 3 of swords, you'd add 3 and the value of the top card of the fate deck. It should be noted that rolls bend this rule a little bit, as they allow specific actions to be treated as trump regardless of the card played. This is where the dragon suit throws a wrench into the equation. As a failed action or opposition, using a dragon card opens you up to a mishap, akin to a fumble in other games. This is counterbalanced with the fact that the dragon suit is the only one that goes up to 10. Most actions can be contested, especially in combat. This is because every action has an ability for the enabler and for the opposition. It's in combat damage that contention might occur. See, your hand acts as both your level and your health. When you take damage, you must discard a number of cards whose total value equals the final damage suffered. So if you take 7 damage, you must discard 7 points worth of cards. It's also worth noting that instead of a spellbook chapter, Dragonlance 5th Age has a method of spell creation where the invocation time, range, duration, area of effect, and type of effect determine both the difficulty to cast as well as the spell points spent. It's a nice alternative to the fire and forget traditions. While there's a lot to like about the card system, there's two major problems I have. One is specifically tied to 5th Age being a fantasy game from TSR, and the other is tied to the Saga system. There's no beating around the bush with one thing. As a fantasy game from TSR, it was inevitable that this game was going to have some of D&D's, well, DNA. In this case, that DNA entails the preferential treatment that casting characters get versus non-casters. This is something I was never fond of, even in my early days of the hobby, and time has not changed this. Then again, the box set does contain a conversion guide to AD&D, so maybe this was inevitable. The second problem I have is the way damage works. It kind of reminds me of the three-pool setup that the Cypher system used, and it has the same problem of allowing a single pool to be multi-purpose. In this case, it makes combat just a little too swingy for my taste, and this isn't a setting that implies a high degree of lethality to justify that. Does the system make combat quicker? Undoubtedly, but there's ways to do this without putting on the consequences so quickly. The video game version of Numenera, as a point in comparison, added an HP system to address this. Just saying. In a weird way, I think 5th Age's biggest problem was the fact that it was developed by TSR. It ends up carrying the assumptions of D&D even if the design philosophies of both games couldn't be further apart. This is also true for the other Saga game, Marvel Adventure, but to a much, much lesser degree. This is a game whose greatest strength is in its freeform capacities, and trying to carry class assumptions without classes does it no favors. What also doesn't help is the lackluster presence of races and roles, the former using the minimum-maximum approach from AD&D, and the latter being mere actions trump. One doesn't belong, and the other's undercooked. As a whole, Saga System is the definition of the diamond in the rough, rough being the operative word here, and as such, I would give it a stamp of recommended. If I didn't have a blatant mistrust of Wizards of the Coast lately, I'd argue this is a game that deserves a remaster, if not outright re-release. I could easily recommend this to people who like to hack their games, as the system on its own has enough potential to create something special. But for our last entry in TSR Month, we'll be heading into the Contemporary for a mission that's a little bit... secretive.